Hello and welcome to ML with AP. Let's learn. Bagging is comprised of two words, is made of two words, bootstrapping and aggregation. To understand bagging, let's first understand a concept which is called bootstrapping. Bootstrapping or in other words, we can call it sample with replacement. Let's see what it is. On the left side of the screen, if you see, think it like a box. And these are the balls, different colored balls in a box or in a basket. Suppose if I ask you to do, to pick one ball with blindfolded, you pick one ball randomly. Blindfolded means same thing as randomly. Pick one ball randomly over here. Okay. And you have to pick nine balls, let's say. But the only condition is once you pick the ball, you see the color, note it down, put it back in the basket. So that, that piece where we put it back in the basket is with replacement. So we'll randomly select a ball over here. Let's say it is blue. For the first sample, we'll mark it one, that we, the first sample and the first observation which we got is one. We'll again pick another ball. By chance, it again came as blue. We'll mark it as two and put it back in the basket. Similarly, we'll, com we'll complete our first bootstrap sample of nine observations out of my original sample. So my original sample is this one on the left side. My first bootstrap sample is this one. What is peculiar or uh, what, what is important about it? That I am sampling this with replacement. So there is a chance that I can not, I may not get any blue ball or there is a chance that I can get one, two or more than few blue balls, right? Because it is randomly selected and selected with a replacement, correct? Similarly, we will do the random sampling and create our bootstrap sample two and bootstrap sample three. If you notice friends over here, as I was saying, since this is randomly selected with replacement, there are more blue balls in random in the bootstrap sample three than one and two. Over here, if you notice, there is only one orange ball in bootstrap sample one, one in the fourth observation and two orange balls in the third bootstrap sample, observation number three and observation number nine. So this is the concept, concept behind bootstrapping or what we call as sample with replacement. Okay. And this is a, this is an essential concept to understand our bagging techniques. Let's move on. So what is bagging? So friend, as I was saying, bagging is made of two words, bootstrap aggregation, B from here, AGG from here. So bagging, bootstrap aggregation. Now bootstrap, we understood it is sampling with replacement. What is this aggregation? This aggregation is nothing but in case of a classification, in case of a classification setting, we take the majority vote. Okay. In case of a regression setting, we take the average or the mean that is aggregation. It's a technique. Let's say you have five people over there. Okay. Three are saying you have five friends. Three are saying that they want to go to the movie. Two are saying they do not want to go to the movie. What we'll select. We'll select the majority vote, right? Three are saying not go to mo go to movie. We'll go to movie, right? That is in the classification when the answer is yes or no, right? or categorical in nature. In case of, let's say, uh, continuous variable or a regression setting, what we take it as a mean or average. That's what aggregation means. Bootstrap, sampling with replacement, aggregation, majority vote, or mean or average, right? That's how the bagging word comes from. Let's understand that what bagging actually means or how this algorithm works. So suppose we have a training set over here and this, this is our training set. Our test set is somewhere else, but training set is comprised of what a small n observations, a small n observations. Out of this, a small n observations, we are creating n m sub samples or m bootstrap samples. So this is my subset or this is my first bootstrap sample. This is my second bootstrap sample. This is my mth bootstrap sample. I'm creating m bootstrap samples. And how many observations I am picking with replacement from my original pool of training set? My original pool of training set had a small n observations. I'm picking k 
capital N observations out of that with replacement, right? So my subset one, how many elements or observation would be there? Capital N observations. Similarly, my all my subset will have capital N observations. But these observations are not unique. These are with replacement, right? So that is the difference. Okay. And how, that's how I am creating my M sub samples or M bootstrap samples. Okay. Now what I will do is I will pass all of these M sub samples through a classifier. And this classifier can be anything. Bagging is a generic technique. It need not be these classifier need not be decision tree. It can be any other classification. You can pick neural network, you can pick SVM, um, or you can pick even logistic regression if you are doing a classification problem, right? So any classifier you can pick over here. And what you do is you train that classifier. Let's say for the, for the sake of example, we are taking decision tree, okay? So you, you train that particular decision tree with my the first model or the first decision tree you train with the sub sample one or the bootstrap sample one. How many elements are there in the bootstrap sample one? Capital N, right? So you train it with that. Similarly, for the second sample, you train a second classifier. Now, bagging, as I was saying, is a generic technique. All these classifiers also need not be the same also. One can be logistic regression, other can be decision tree. Like you, 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 are, you are free to choose that. But for the sake of this example, we'll consider everything as decision tree and proceed. Okay. So this is how you train all your classifiers. Now every, now let's say our model is trained now. Okay. And a new observation come and we have to do the prediction. What we'll do? Our, we'll pass that prediction. We'll pass that observation. Sorry, that observation through each of these classifiers. Okay, let's say the classifier outputs one, classifier two outputs zero. Similarly, classifier M will output one or zero depending on that. What we'll do as a part of aggregation, as I was telling you, we'll do a majority voting. So whichever class is in the majority, whether it's a class one, if it's a binary classification problem, whichever class is in the majority, we'll take that as the majority vote and that as the prediction of our bagging algorithm or bagging model, right? Understood? This is what bootstrap aggregation or bagging is all about. Let's try to understand again. As I was saying that bagging involves fitting many decision tree. It need not be decision tree. It's a generic algorithm. You can fit any, any uh, classification algorithms. Okay. But what we are doing, we are taking the test data. We are building models, individual models. And what data we are passing in during the training stage, we are passing bootstrap sampled, bootstrap sample through each of these models, different bootstrap samples. So three models, three bootstrap samples will pass through each of these models. And then if the time of testing, if a, or a time in production, if a new observation comes, we pass it through these three models. Let's say the model prediction is one, one or zero. What will be the majority? The majority is one over here. Our overall prediction of this bagging model is one. This is what bagging is all about. Okay. Bootstrapping and aggregation. That's all. Let's move on. Let's see that this is how the bagging works. But why does why does bagging works, right? It's a, it's a fantastic algorithm. It gives good prediction, but why does it work? Friends, if you recall in my first video on this topic, I was discussing in detail about the bias variance trade-off. Where does the bagging lie? The bagging is mostly on the high variance side, right? The, the, the models, the individual base models, which we have created, let's say decision tree or any other model, we have created fully grown decision trees, right? So our models, the individual models or the base estimators are falling in the high variance category. Okay. It lies in this particular region over there. And if it lies in this particular region, what is our sweet spot with respect to bias variance? Okay, this is our sweet spot, right? Where the test, my test error is low and my training error is comparatively low. So it's a, it's, a, it's a spot where my variance is low without losing too much on the bias side, okay? Okay, so now why does bagging work? Why does bagging work? That, that, that was the question, right? 
So bagging essentially works because when we are doing the aggregation, what happening is that we are reducing the variance of our individual base estimators. Okay, that is one reason why bagging works, right? So bagging starts with high variance region, but when we do aggregation, we are we are pulling it down over here on this region. That is one thing, right? On the aggregation side, on the bootstrapping side also, since we are randomly selecting observations with replacement, right? Then any effect of outliers, right, or any effect of individual observations are negated in that way, right? We are able to look those observations, every observations and their impact are coming out as it should be. Okay. So that is the second reason. Both bootstrapping or the sampling with replacement and aggregation helps in reducing the variance over here, right? And it helps in pulling it down towards the center, the sweet spot. Okay. Now, friends, you must be wondering at least few of the questions which must be coming into your mind. Let's answer those questions. Uh, so as I was saying that bagging is a generic concept or a generic algorithm. You can use anything as a base estimator. It need not be decision tree. It is mostly used in relation with the decision tree, but it need not be. Okay. And it can be used for regression or classification model both. In regression, what you need to do to do the prediction, you have to take the mean or the average in case of classification, majority voting, right? So, so that, that, that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is that how many based estimators should we choose? And the, by base estimator, like how many such models we have to choose, right? Is there a count of that? The answer to that is that this thing is a hyperparameter. Now, hyperparameter is a model which needs to be tuned, right? So what we can do is that we can we can tune this using um, hyperparameter grid search, right? We can tune it that how many models we should select, but empirically scientists and researchers have found that anything which is greater than 100, 100 models are more than sufficient. After that only your, because more models you add, I'm sure that you are getting, going to get better predictive power, right? But more models you add, understand that that will take more compute from you for the training time, right? It will, you need to train many more models. So if you are able to train 100 models, that should be good enough. After that, the return or the impact or the positive uh, thing which you are getting out of adding models and the gain in accuracy does not do a cost benefit analysis. Let's put it this way. So the amount of gain in accuracy which we'll get after model uh, after model reach a particular number let's say 100 after that if you keep adding models that gain in accuracy is very less compared to how much compute you have to spend okay so empirically it has been found that okay anything beyond 100 is, you should not go okay so that's why it is saying that you usually keep it the number of models between 10 and 100 beyond 100 compute becomes costly with no benefit in predictive power the third is the depth of the base estimator. Let's say you have selected decision tree. What should be the depth of my decision tree? Again, it's a hyperparameter, which you need to do a, maybe a hyperparameter search space uh, and then do that. But typically we are seeing that, okay, you can start with a fully grown because fully grown decision tree are usually high on variance, right? And our models, our base estimators, we are assuming in case of bagging techniques that they are high on variance and we are going to pull it down towards the low variance stage, right? So you can start with either fully grown or slightly pruned decision tree. As the last point is, as I was saying that the base estimators need not be from one single algorithm or model, right? So you can have all permutation and combinations over there. One thing is you can start with all models a decision tree that is also acceptable. You can start everything as a logistic regression or SVM that is also acceptable. What you can do in turn is that one model be logistic regression, other one be SVM, the other one is decision tree and vice versa, right? You can do the mix match also while, be, while building your base estimator. That is also acceptable, okay? 
so i hope you these are the some questions which i thought that every it will come in everybody's mind when you are seeing this video i thought that it would be good to answer those beforehand now the question is that we know that bagging works but why does it work i was telling you a few minutes back about the bias variance trade off right so when we do multiple base estimators let's say from multiple models then the diversity of these models in itself tries to reduce the variance right that's why it works secondly the when we start uh, as i was saying that we start over here right we start with the high variance zone right but we when we do aggregation or majority voting or mean or average when we do that then what we are doing we are internally we are in turn pulling down the overall the the meta model right or the bagging model down to less variance zone and when we will pull this less, less variance zone or low variance zone then we'll reach somewhere over here which is our goal anyway the third thing is that when we are doing this random sampling we are reducing the impact of outlier and the noisy samples right so by chance there will be models or there will be sub samples which will not get these noisy data right and even if it gets the noisy data then we'll have another sub sample where this effect will be negated right we'll get uh, on one, maybe in one sub sample we'll get extreme end extreme right on the other sub sample we'll get extreme left and these things will get cancelled out this is the same philosophy if you recall my first video i was telling about the wisdom of the crowd a child was under reporting or underestimating the number of balls in the boxes and a old lady was or a lady was overestimating that right so these both things are outliers right but they are what they are doing they are crossing out each other right so similar philosophy works over here in case of bagging also now random forest random forest is bagging technique okay and it just has one slight twist so that slight twist will try to understand now we know what is bootstrapping right now till now what we are doing we are bootstrapping observations the number of the rows of our observations if we start doing some sampling or bootstrapping on features also on the columns also that becomes random forest let's try to understand how it is done okay so we'll do everything like how we are doing in the bagging technique we'll sub sample probably n sub samples over here right and we'll start building the decision trees over here the only caveat to this or only change over here is that when we are building these decision trees right at every layer of this decision tree what we'll do we'll sub sample the number of features okay so let's say over here we started with feature let's say 1 to m okay again we'll at this layer when it comes we'll sub sample the feature so the features which were there at the stage 1 or the or, or the first uh, layer at the second layer we'll have completely different set of features to account for and we'll do the splitting based on these new features so over here on the second layer let's say we'll have only completely different set of features we'll get and again the splitting criteria will remain the same we have to consider gini index or we have to consider the entropy but we we'll limit ourselves to those many features which are sub sampled at that stage makes sense and then after that everything remains the same again majority voting in case of classification setting or in case of regression we'll do the average or the mean right that's what random forest is all about so only one twist and that twist is that instead of uh, not just sampling sub samples row wise or observations at every split will sub sample the feature also and then that's how we will build the tree okay and again random forest is not generic like bagging so you have to rely on the decision tree you have to build it decision tree right you cannot use any other base estimator for that now what are the hyper parameters or the again these are the questions which will come to our mind right how many trees to grow now this is a now base estimator is a decision tree how many trees to grow then again like bagging 
like how many more how many models you want you wanted 100 models after that uh, it, maybe it doesn't do the cost benefit analysis right it doesn't work out the benefit which you are getting and the cost which you are putting doesn't work out right so it depends on the data size complexity or but empirically less than 100 should be good but it's a hyper parameter you can derive it using the cross validation techniques also now what should be the depth of the base estimator decision tree now this is random forest all the base estimators are decision trees what should be the depth of those the depth of those again is a uh, your hyper parameter but you can start with a fully grown decision tree no problem because uh, our random forest also expects our base models to be on the right side to be on the high variance side right overfitting when we do start doing this um, random forest regularization or subsampling this will offset our uh, overfitting considerations how many features to be subsampled i was telling you over there that ev at every split you have to do the at this split at this split every split you have to do the subsampling of the feature now let's say we start with m features how many features we should subsample okay how many features we should subsample now that is the question usually this is again a hyper parameter but a good initial guess to start with is the square root of m let's say you have 100 feature a square root of 100 is 10 so at every layer only pick 10 features at every layer of a split of the decision tree only pick randomly 10 sample 10 features or 10 columns and 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 do a split at that layer of your decision tree based on those number of features right so the empirical rule says that a square root m works good okay but again it's a hyper parameter if you have the compute you can do the cross validation and calculate it okay now let's see one more time the algorithm for i have already described the algorithm but let's see it how the pseudo code works right so we have the training set we have only one feature x and y right y is our labels uh, output labels and x is our features now the number of decision tree to be grown is t let's say we are assuming that this t is the number of models which we are growing or number of decision trees or number of models which we have the number of features to consider at each split m now capital m was the total feature usually m is the square root of m what i was telling you right the small m the number of features to subsample at every stage a small m and a small m is typically a square root of big m right now these are the notations right so what is our algorithm says for t is equal to 1 to t because we have to build t number of trees capital t number of trees create a bootstrap sample again same like how we are doing for bagging bt by randomly sample n samples from x with replacement from x what we have to do we have to subsample with replacement right and we have to build our samples then grow a decision tree using bt using this some sample we grow a decision decision tree we build a decision tree using the training set what we'll do for each node randomly select m features of the total m features now m a small m is usually the square root of big m split the node using the features that maximizes the reduction in impurity again i was saying that how the split in the decision tree happens it will remain the same gene index or entropy uh, if you have not watched my video on the decision tree please go ahead and watch that so again we'll do the uh, our splitting based on gene index and entropy the only thing which we'll consider is that we'll only subsample a small m features every time at every split right and we'll add that decision tree to the forest so forest is nothing but combination of trees right so we are building individual models and individual decision tree and the entire thing we are calling it is a model okay or a forest now there is one more concept which i wanted you to understand is the out of bag now what is out of bag now let me go first over here and i will tell you okay let's say we are we are sampling this okay this is this is our bootstrap sampling right we are sampling this it may happen it is not although depicted here it may happen that just by chance will not get any green ball okay yeah this is the one like bootstrap sample 3 if you notice over here in bootstrap sample 3 there is no green ball although two are there in the bag 
I'm not getting any one of them, right? I didn't get any of these. So these samples are called out of bag for my bootstrap sample three, right? I didn't get, although it was there in my original sample, in my bootstrap sample, I didn't receive those, okay? So these are out of bag. Just by sheer chance, there will be some observation which will not get, right? Because we are doing with replacement, right? So there will be some observation which will always remain out of bag that it didn't come back in the, that is the concept of out of bag. Let's say how it is utilized. Yeah, over here. Now, in this particular example, if you see the out of bag S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, my first sample is S2, S5, S1. What will be the out of bag? S2 and S3, no, not S3, S3, S3 and S4 will become out of bag for first sample, right? S3 and S4 become out of bag for first sample. What we do is, friends, understand this, that S3, S4 is out of bag for this. So if I train this model on this particular subsample, rather than utilizing my test data, which I have kept, maybe what I can do is, I can, because this model has not seen, this model has not seen, or this decision tree has been trained only on S2, S3, and S, S2, S5, and S1. It has not seen S3 and S4. Let me run this model on S3, S4. For this model, S3, S4 will act same way as if it is a test data, right? Correct? S3, S4 will act same as if it is a test data. That is called out of bag, right? Out of bag. So similarly, the out of bag over here for this sample will run it over here. Out of bag for this sample observation will run it over here. And what we'll do for all those out of bag, what we'll do is we'll calculate their uh, predictions for the individual models. Okay, get them. What we'll do again, it is like we are passing the testing data, okay, through the model. And then we'll calculate the error rate for that. That will be considered as an out of bag error rate. So that also gives you a good prediction that how my random forest model is working, right, with the out of bag error without utilizing your test data, right, your or holdout set, right, validation set. You are still holding that out, but you are. You are getting your one more metric for unseen data on your model through this out of bag technique. Okay. Now, one thing to note over here, if you see on the top right side, right. Now, the, what is the, what will be the probability that one, if there are let's say n samples over here, capital n samples. Okay. What is the probability that one any one of them is not picked at all? And I'm taking n samples, let's say n samples, and I'm building subsample also with the n, okay? So my subsample also is not just three, but a n, n dimensional or n observations. So the probability of not getting a sample picked in the first draw, first time I'm putting my hand in the bag and I'm drawing, what is the probability that I will pick, a, let's say a red ball, the probability of picking a red ball, and let's say there is just one red ball over here in that sample, it will be one by n, right? There are total n balls. There is only one red ball. To pick the, pro the probability will be one by n, right? What is the probability of not picking that red ball? Let's say there is just one red ball. One minus one by n, correct? How many times we are picking? We are picking n number of times. We are doing this subsampling n number of times. What will be the combined probability that even after I put my hand n times, draw n times and draw and again with replacement n times and that red ball not even once it came. What is the probability of that? 1 minus 1 by n times 1 minus 1 by n and this multiplication will continue how many times? n times because the probability of one time not getting red ball is 1 minus 1 by n. Second time not getting is will be multiplied by it, right? Probability also always get multiplied, right? So ultimately, what will be the probability of the red ball not picking that red ball even after nth iteration, one minus one by n to the power n. And friends, for very 
large n number and this can be proven mathematically right for very large n number if you limit n to infinity that times it tends toward this whole number will become 1 by e so this uh, e is the eulers number it will become 1 by e which is nothing but 0.368 what it is say, telling you that the probability of a ball not getting picked when you are doing a subsampling is 36.8 percent right and if you notice this graph over here on this side right the blue line represents 1 minus 1 by n to the power n and your 1 by e is represented by this green line so as as n keeps increasing over here as keeps increasing you see it is tending towards 1 by e right so what i'm trying to tell over here that out of bag there is a good 36.8 percent balls which will not be picked or 8 percent 38.8 percent observations in a particular sample which will not be picked right so th there is a lot of data which we are not utilizing okay and we are only relying on test set so that's why the out of bag error is utilizing those percentage of data which has not been picked which has not been utilized for uh, for uh, training or base estimator model is utilized also that is called out of bag error okay let's code using scikit-learn okay so here is my scikit-learn my jupyter notebook first thing first let me get the version number and i will do first the bagging so bagging also we have a bagging classifier in scikit-learn what i am doing over here is i am downloading pima btx data set okay so it is there online somewhere i found i put the url and i am downloading it okay i did a df minus head over here i see that it has got eight features and the last feature outcome is a binary classification problem like whether person has a diabetes or not diabetes right so pregnancy glucose blood pressure skin thickness insulin bmi all those things right what i'm doing is i'm separating my x and y variable and i got x head y head x shape is 768 observations are there y shape 768 observations are there cool nothing great over here all useless stuff okay now here I will start doing my banging classifier. I'm importing some libraries over here, uh, mainly cross-validation score because I will do cross-validation accuracy score also. My banging classifier because I'm using a classifier. I'll do the train test split also. Let's see. So I'm doing a train test split on my X and Y. Okay, and I'm doing a stratified. So my stratification is Y. If you do not know about stratification, let me know in the comment. I will probably make a video out of it. But stratification essentially means that the the amount or percentage of Y or one or zero class in my test and train set should remain same, right? If in the original population my my one is only twenty percent of the time. My train split should also have 20% of Y. My test split should also have only 20% of Y. You should maintain that consistency of the proportion. That's what a stratification says. Test size is 0.25. My training size will become 0.75. Random state is for reproducibility and I am setting up as a 42. Okay. I'm defining the model over here, bagging classifier. That is what I'm going to use. I'll do a model on model.fit on X train, Y train. I will do a Y predict, Y predict on my X train itself. I wanted to see that how badly it has overfit, if it has overfit, right? Check the accuracy uh, on the same data on my X train itself. I'm checking the accuracy. It has given me 0 0.98, 98%, right? So looks like it is done terrible overfitting over here. Let's do the cross validation to validate that whether we have done overfitting or not. Now cross validation for, I, again, I will pass it through cross value score. I will pass the model, which is my bagging classifier, X train, Y train. Uh, I'll pass the scoring mechanism for my cross value score is accuracy. And I want to do a 10 fold cross validation. Now cross validation, as you know, that like this data will be split into 10 parts. It will be trained on nine parts and the 10th part will be uh, it will be tested on 10th part right 
So this is how the fundamental uh, cross-validation works. Now, for when we report the performance of cross-validation, since it is a tenfold cross-validation, I am going to get a list of 10 accuracy scores, right? For all those folds, I'll get one accuracy score. And I will do a mean of that, I'll get an average accuracy score, right? So my average accuracy score on my training set itself is 75%. But when I calculated through this without cross validation, it was 98. This clearly says that uh, it is overfitting, okay? Let's run it on the test set just to see that it's really overfitting. The test set result came at 72 or 73 percent, which is slightly, which is closer to my cross validation score. So these two are matching, which is fine. This is extremely high. That means it is overfitting. We have to do some, something about it. Okay. Next thing, we should improve it, right? So what we do? Okay. Now, how many models which we are creating? We are creating the default, I think is 10. Let me see the default. Yeah, the number of estimators for buying classifiers, right? You can see in the signature, it is 10. What I'm doing is like, okay, let me put 30 estimators and out of bag, which was just telling you that um, predict the out of bag score also. Okay, I will do a model at fit by predict. Again, the same thing, accuracy score, I will do. 99.82 so if i increase the number of estimators probably it is going higher and higher right what what it was earlier 98.2 now it has become 99.82 model dot o b score underscore right this is the parameter which i was talking about the out of bag score now friends if you notice there is a significant difference between 99.8 this is still on training right I, I didn't pass my test. I still passed my H train, but my out of bag score gives me a more accurate representation without using my test score, without using my cross validation score, a more accurate result that how my model is going to fare when it is thrown into the production, right? With the new observations, it is 73.61. You see the difference over here? between the outer bag and the, the accuracy score with Y train and Y predict. Huge. Okay, let's do the cross validation and check this accuracy. Again, we'll do the cross validation tenfold. My, as predicted, my accuracy will remain around 75%, which is very close to outer bag or test score. Let's run it on the test scores, 73.95. So clearly, whatever I was doing with the, with increasing the N estimator parameter over here is not working out right. My test score has not improved. My out of bag score, my cross validation scores are all low, right? And my model is still overfitting, right? What should I do? Again, I should do a grid search CV, right? I should do a hyperparameter search. To do that, SQLearn provides you grid search CV. Again, my decision tree classifier is there. Okay, and what I will do is I will, I need to pass in my bagging classifier that I'm, my base estimator is decision tree classifier. Oh, one thing, if you notice friends over here, I didn't specify any uh, base estimator over here, right? Let me show you. Uh, where is that? Yeah base estimator okay if i didn't do not specify anything what it takes it takes decision tree classifier as the as the default right that's why it took decision tree internally bagging classifier will take decision tree as a base classifier but over here I'm specifying it, okay? My base estimator is decision tree classifier. And I am providing my search space over here, right? Now, these are the parameters which I wanted to tune, right? So the base estimator max depth, base estimator min sample leaf, and some features, right? Max samples, max features, how many features should be there, right? Which should be, which should be uh, subsampled. N estimators, like how many estimators I should search, right? So the way grid search CV works is that it will, for let's say 
for this combination of three it is going to evaluate it will keep this three and constant and all the combinations of all the other features right so if there are five there are three then five into three into this into number of this into number of this that many time my model will be built and tested right so it's a very compute intensive search right even on my 32 cpu machine i think is it was taking um, five minutes or so right so i, I would recommend not to run it okay um, but this is how grid search cv works right so uh, yeah i will pass that into the grid search cv object my bagging classifier my 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 grid over here and how many times now if i pass cv with five words that means all these things like four into five into three into four into three into five will be repeated fivefold right so you can imagine how many times my model is getting built right now i will do a fit of that and then i will search for the best parameter and the best scores this is my best parameter out of the search space which I have provided. This is my base, best parameter and my best score is 78%. So if, friends, if you recall, it had increased from some 73, 74% to 78%, right? By doing a grid search CV. Okay. So there are other tuning techniques also. I do not go because this tutorial is only about how the, the bagging was in Escalon, right? How the random forest learn, right? exactly the same thing with scale and you just need to specify okay i want to train instead of buying classifier a random forest classifier and everything remains the same right you are again you run this badly overfit right my accuracy is 1.0 cross validation the accuracy the mean accuracy becomes 76.22 percent on the test set it is 74 percent Again, you can do a cross validation, um, a grid search CV or a randomized search CV over here and try to get better performance by tuning the hyperparameter. But essentially, this is how random forest scikit-learn API works, right? With that being said, I will close this video over here. I will see you all in the next video. Bye.